So welcome everyone. My name is Anna Petherick and I'm a Departmental Lecturer in Public Policy at the Blavatnik School of Government. It's my pleasure to welcome Martin Gustafsson, who's an Associate Professor in, in the Economics Department of Stellenbosch University in South Africa. And Martin also spends quite a bit of time in the Ministry of Education. Now, this conversation is part of a series of conversations with experts um, about COVID-19, but it's a particularly special one for those of, uh, of you listening um, who have been coding the Oxford uh, tracker, um, because Martin has written a paper using the data from the Oxford tracker, looking at different African countries' public policy responses to COVID-19. So welcome, Martin. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. So um, to start with, I wondered if you could outline for us your main conclusions about the diversity of responses to COVID-19 among different African countries. Well, I, I mean, I should say that, that today is, 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 is the 12th of May. Things will change in the coming weeks. The paper was came out about two weeks ago. So, so yeah, so, so some of the things might might be might have changed since the paper came out, um, but the things that are probably not going to change are um, findings such as that um, developing countries tend to uh, impose more stringent restrictions. Uh, I I ran a I ran a multivariate model using um, the Oxford data plus some World Bank data um, just to, to look at some conditional correlations. And yes, uh, developing countries um, are imposing more stringent uh, restrictions. Um, and in part, that seems to be explained by the capacity of the health system and in particular, the availability of hospital beds. So controlling for everything else, countries with fewer hospital beds relative to population have been imposing more stringent restrictions, which would be in line with the idea that uh, countries want to avoid um, an overburdened uh, health system. Um, what I also played around with was, was, was establishing some kind of predicted level of, of stringency um, for specific countries, depending on, 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 on country variables. And that led me then to this conclusion that, that South Africa is an above average uh, stringent uh, restrictor, um, workplace restrictions, educational restrictions. It's, it's, it's a little bit more stringent than than other developing countries. Uh, it's on a par with Latin America. Despite everything they say about Brazil, Latin America as a whole has been very stringent uh, in and very quick to impose restrictions. And South Africa is more or less in, in line with that level of stringency. The rest of Africa, um, it varies a lot, but uh, in general, well, by the time I had written the the paper, the levels of stringency in Africa were were not that high. Okay. Well, hopefully we'll come back to you in a few weeks and, and get an update on all of this. Um, uh, do you have an explanation for uh, South Africa's particularly stringent response, uh, given what you would expect? This is now not really based on the data. This is more, you know, based on, on what I know about South Africa. Um, I would say that the relatively strong formal sector in South Africa and the very weak informal sector in South Africa would uh, make South Africa more inclined to, to impose stringent restrictions. It's logistically more possible than in an economy with a lot of informal trading and, 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 and manufacturing uh, and, and so on. And I think... Um, if you look at Africa, it's the countries with uh, a stronger formal sector, such as South Africa and Botswana, and countries that are very commodity dependent, uh, Angola, again, Botswana, diamonds, um, 
uh, which have uh, imposed quite stringent restrictions. Yeah, probably because you know countries that 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 depend heavily on say oil are not going to see their um, see tax revenues interrupted to such a large degree if uh, workplace restrictions are, are, are put in place, uh, for instance. Okay, so I wonder if you could just explain a bit more about South Africa's, as you put it, strong formal sector and weaker informal sector, just so that we understand. All right, well, South Africa is quite a strange uh, developing country in, in, in the sense that it has a highly developed formal sector uh, in which about a third of the population kind of exists and, 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 and works, well, a third to a half. And then a, another kind of half um, of the economy, which is, which in a way should be informal. Um, it's very poor. Um, it depends a lot for its survival on a massive system of social grants. Um, so there's, South Africa has a particularly advanced social grant system. So in a sense, the formal part of the economy is kind of supporting the survival of a much poorer other half. Uh, and this is very much a, 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 as a result of the apartheid uh, legacy, uh, but also, you know, the limited success, I think, in the last 20 years in, in, in trying to kind of undo that uh, apartheid legacy. So South Africa is quite an, is, is a pretty unusual uh, developing country in that respect. Um, so that actually is is good to know uh, when it comes to thinking about the effectiveness of policies, right? Because our data, the the Oxford Tracker project, is just about the the policies that have been uh, agreed upon, right? We don't know very much about uh, implementation and therefore the effectiveness on the ground of different policies. So, what do you know about that in the South African case? Well, we we have had a a few surveys, um, but there haven't been random surveys yet. There is a large, or a very ambitious, uh, random uh, telephonic survey that is about to be launched. Um, but so far, we have very little data to tell us uh, how the implementation of these restrictions have uh, unfolded. Um, but, you know, for just looking at the news, I mean, what, what you can see is that um, the, the, the more formal part of the economy is uh, complying with the restrictions, uh, in part because the legal system is quite uh, developed in South Africa. So companies that don't comply, you know, face, could face legal consequences. On the other hand, um, the, the part of, 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 of South African society that is more outside the, the formal um, sector, uh, there, you, one, there have been a lot of news articles about uh, people walking around in the streets, not complying with the lockdown. Um, but uh, things certainly have changed across the, the entire country because of policing. There's been an enormous presence of uh, the police, um, the army, um, in a way we haven't seen in South Africa since the 1980s and 1990s, the apartheid era. So this is a little bit terrifying for uh, South Africans and there are, there are cases of, of abusive uh, policing. Um, what one could also, what what many are also questioning is 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 the rationality of some of the restrictions. The restrictions are are are, are they could be a, in some respects among the most extreme in the world. Cigarettes, for example, are banned. Uh, the the sale transportation of cigarettes are banned. Alcohol is banned, um, al which for me makes quite a lot of sense because uh, because of the association between alcohol and and uh, social events and mixing, um, but the cigarette ban has, has, has 
caused a lot of, 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 of tension. So, so one is looking at, at a situation where there's a lot of policing, a lot of rules which many would regard as petty, and people have difficulties seeing the link between some of these rules and uh, sp preventing the spread of COVID-19. Um, so, so yes, yeah, a combination of kind of a, a legal system that works relatively well plus fairly unprecedented policing is has up till now brought about fairly high levels of compliance, although the police can't be everywhere. So in this, you know, rural areas, for example, people are walking around, people are, people are not in, in, in their houses. Right. I could also imagine that a ban on alcohol um, is, is partly motivated by not wanting to overload the health system um, for other reasons. Mm. Um, and I imagine that uh, the logic of, of banning uh, cigarettes is similar, right? You, if you, you're trying to reduce the risk that people who are at risk, probably because they smoke, um, are taking on, or, or you're trying to reduce their risk, if you like, of COVID. Um, is that mm. how it's been explained to people or has it not really been explained? I think that's the problem is it hasn't been explained in that in that manner. So um, communication um, could could have been stronger. Um, the focus has been very much on these are the rules. You had better stick to them. Um, the logic behind the rules is often not explained. And many have said there is no logic behind some of the rules. I mean, for example, alcohol, I think, has a clearer logic than 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 cigarettes. So taking all this together, and I, I know this is a really, really hard question, but um, taking what you know about the, the policies and how they've been ex uh, explained to people and how they've been, um, I, I guess, imposed um, on the ground, what what advice would you give policymakers about the process of loosening restrictions? Ooh. <laughs> um, difficult one. Um, the what, what what seems again? I mean, I would go back to the to the question of uh, communication and the assumptions of a government around essentially the intelligence of the population. I mean, can, there are um, the, 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 the accusations that, that the, to some extent the, the existing restrictions are treating the population like children. So, um, yeah, I mean, the, 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 the advice should probably be be very careful about um, your one's communication strategies and be careful in, in ensure that when one communicates what people must do when you when you re, when you remove some of these restrictions that people actually understand um, how the this virus works because that is what is going to help like proper physical distancing um, that 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 can reduce, yeah, delay and flatten uh, the the curve. So one, I mean, I, I find in, in in for example in South Africa the the everyone is wearing rubber gloves now, but it almost I I, don't, I think a lot of people are not quite understanding you know what the purpose is of those gloves um many would argue that actually the gloves are a minor part of the you know total defense against the virus uh, i think there's a there's a there's a level at which people are not fully understanding the virus and then attach kind of themselves to symbolic things like putting on the gloves gives one reassurance but then if one is doesn't really understand how the virus is transmitted that's not enough um, so, so, I mean, going back to your question around how does one get out of these restrictions, one is going to have to, um, yeah, treat the population as adults. Um, all right. I mean, you know, m developing countries are often, you know, not Sweden. They don't have the, 
the level of, of, of education, it's, it, it, it's difficult to communicate some of these things. But as far as possible, I think one, one, the, the emphasis needs to shift towards giving uh, kind of people um, some more responsibility as opposed to simply imposing restrictions which are not always clear to people. Okay, that's really well put. And um, let's talk about education a bit more because that's your specialism. Um, so I wondered actually if we could start off by if you could just give us a bit of a, a, a picture of um, how education, just in a very simple sense, how it works in South Africa, um, what level most people get educated to, whether most schools are private or public, that kind of thing. All right. Um, it's, a, it's a very public system. And that, again, is an inheritance from the, the apartheid uh, era um, from a from a development perspective what is uh, very important to understand about South Africa's education system is that the quality of learning outcomes is particularly poor at the school level now all countries say the quality of the education is poor yeah but it, yeah, if you if you run an international comparison, you can see that relative to to the country's general level of development, uh, South Africa's um, performance in 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 in, in we, we participate in TIMS and PEARLS uh, and an African program called SACMEC. Um, South Africa children perform very poorly. They read poorly, um, and and levels of mathematics are quite poor. Um, there, there, there's also evidence that even the middle class in South Africa is really underperforming compared to equivalent middle classes in other developing countries. For example, Kenya. Our middle class performs worse than the Kenyan middle class. So there's a, and this, you know, from, from, a, from a development perspective in terms of, you know, the human capital model, if you want to look at this from an e economics of education perspective, uh, this is... This is a serious. This is a serious problem that will have repercussions into post-school education, into the labour market, into productivity. Um, and uh, I mean, what is interesting is that this was not really. This was not understood broadly in South Africa 15 years ago. It is now understood, and I think that's largely because because of of, of data um, and communication of what that data means. I think now everyone understands that we have a problem here. Um, and the, in fact, the, the, the data points to improvements over the last 20 years of a very low base. I mean, we used to be well below Botswana, our neighbor. Now we're kind of on a par, but even Botswana is a relatively poor performer amongst developing countries. So we need to, we need to continue uh, moving, moving up. Um, so we have a quality problem. We, we also have quite an interesting um, qualifications problem. And I think Latin American countries tend to see something similar. We, the only school qualification we have is at the end of grade 12, at the end of secondary schooling. Whereas many other African countries have qualifications before that. So... Um, yeah, in South Africa, a lot of the policy focus is on we must get all uh, youths to complete 12 years of education because that's the first qualification you obtain. Currently, we're sitting at about half, and this is regarded as a national disaster in South Africa. And uh, obviously, that, that should improve, but that's actually quite normal by middle-income standards. Uh, in middle-income countries... This is generally what you find. I think, I think in China, about 60% of, of youths are successfully complete uh, 12 years of education. In the United States, it's, 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 I think it's around 90%. So, so it's, it's, what's unusual about South Africa is not having some kind of qualification below that, which can then facilitate... Uh, interactions in the labor market and, and interactions within uh, other training institutions uh, beyond schools. So South Africa, to, I mean, to sum up, South Africa spends a lot on education, 
we cover a lot of the population in schooling, but not so much in post-school education. There we are actually quite low when it comes to participation. Um, and quality is, is, is something that, that we need to, we have to address. And in a way we are addressing it, but it's, it, it's one of those things where it's difficult to communicate some of this data because people see the popular perception is that the schools are terrible. So to try and say, oh, but there's improvement, and then people say, no, but look at the schools. They look terrible. Um, teachers aren't, you know, aren't in class, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then, you know, as a researcher, the point one has to make is, yes, but it's improving. And the critical question, and this is something I've looked a lot into, uh, is what are the speeds of improvement one can expect? Because, yes, everyone wants improvement, but at what point does a government... Or does a society say, well, the improvements are about as fast as we can expect. Let's just have patience. Let's just accept that, you know, we're not going to change everything overnight. I'm just going to pick up on that before we talk about the impact of COVID, because um, <laughs> I think um, I think that's a really uh, important point, right, to to bridge the gap between the research and policy making i think it's really important to highlight successes where you where you have them and to um and to set reasonable targets based on evidence um do you have any broader advice for people say working in education ministries about how to do that a few tips right it, in a nutshell because i know s s many of your students are working in government or, 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 or are likely to work in government um a few, and I do a lot of work in government. I mean, the, 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 the advice I generally give is, first of all, don't worry too much about targets. Accept that targets are going to be politically set. In any government, it's not researchers, it's not technicians, it's politicians who set targets. You may, you should strive to get politicians to make targets that are as realistic as possible, but don't worry if they are not realistic in the end, because politics works different, differently to research, especially in developing countries. Um, so number one, accept that. Number two, um, work a lot at getting the data right, because there are a lot of problems with the data. I mean, I, 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 I've, you know, I've worked a lot with UNESCO data and UNESCO is great. It, it allows one to do international comparisons, etc. cetera. Um, but a lot of the, the trend data that you see within countries and international bodies such as UNESCO is not that good. So you have to really look carefully at it and make judgments about what can you trust and what can you not trust. Be very, very careful about measuring trends. Um, and that applies to education, employment, even GDP. So one needs to be one needs to be sufficiently skeptical um, without saying that you know we can't measure anything because we can measure things. We just have to be sufficiently careful about it. And um, and then yes, I mean I think the the the, the researcher, the, the the monitoring person, the te the technical person in government. I think largely your job is to say, to answer the question, not did we meet the targets and if, if not, why didn't we meet the targets? Because lots of those targets are unrealistic. Your job is to say, have we made progress? Has that progress been about as fast as one could reasonably expect on the basis of perhaps what happens in other countries, the specific conditions in that, in, in your own country, um, so that you come up with a story which is about the glass perhaps being half full as opposed to the part of the glass that is, that is half empty. And often politicians will accept that. Politicians are often fine to say, okay, we didn't meet our target, but you know what? Our monitoring people say that we have, uh, we've made a, you know, we've made progress and in fact our progress is as fast as, you know, one could expect in a developing country. Of course, if your country is not making progress, then you have an even more difficult situation uh, because then the pressure is really on you 
as a technical person in government to make up stories. I, I experience that. I see people um, who have to endure this. And this is, this is really difficult. Um, obviously, one must resist. Um, one should not... One should not be spinning for government as a, as a researcher. In a way, it's a waste of your own human, human capital, um, your own skills. Um, but a lot of researchers end up doing that, especially if you're working in, in government. Let's just talk, go back to the current situation, because I imagine um, that there's going to be a, quite a big impact on learning outcomes from COVID-19 in South Africa. Mm. Um, what do you anticipate or what do we know so far? But what do you anticipate? Well, first, I think I think it's it's important to 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 emphasise that educational development happens fairly slowly. A lot of it is a, based on what what fundamental skills students are acquiring. Now, if you interrupt a schooling system for one or even two months. Um, it's probably not a disaster for that kind of development. They, what I still want to do is to look into some research relating to the impact of, in particular, teacher strikes. There's, there's research into, you know, so some countries have been through prolonged periods of teacher strikes, and sometimes one sees the impacts of that even in the labor market a couple of decades later, depending on, you know, when you were at school. So, there, it's, there is some impact, but um, I would say that the my fears are in, 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 in education in South Africa are not so much that you know our loss of one or two months is is is, is going to you know destroy you know the progress that we've been seeing. I think that that progress can endure. My concern is more the broader impact of COVID-19 on the economy. And I mean, it, it's, it's astounding. I mean, we're still trying to understand uh, what this means for a country like South Africa. We were already in a terrible economic situation before COVID-19. Um, our debt situation was very bad. And this is, this is now pushing us over the edge in a way. So um, there are going to be all sorts of impacts on teacher pay, the pay of public servants, um, that then could have an impact on, on their motivation. Uh, we have very strong teacher unions in South Africa. And if the um, labor environment is, is unstable, then schools suffer. So I think COVID-19 is most worrying with respect to the, 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 the broader, more economic, indirect impacts uh, yeah, obviously, the, there were plans to, there are plans to expand post-school education. As I said, there are not enough university and, 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 and post-school students in South Africa. The fiscal situation after, brought about by COVID-19 makes that very, very difficult. Um, so these are, these are very serious uh, threats to education, but of course, to society at large. And just sort of tying that with what you were saying before about having no qualification unless you get to the end of, of high school, um, I would imagine that uh, some social groups are going to see uh, their children, if you like, drop out, their teenagers drop out at higher rates before they get to the end of high school because of this period and the economic effects of this period than other social groups. For example, perhaps poorer households, perhaps uh, girls more than boys? I don't know. What, what do you anticipate there? Well, because the schooling system is very public, because we have um, even, even school feed, we have school feeding even at the secondary level, which is fairly unusual. Um, we, I think that, that um, the dropping out problem is not going to be our worst problem. I, you know, they, they, as, I, as I explained, you know, 50% of, of uh, uh, youths do not successfully complete the grade 12 uh, qualification. 
Um, but almost all uh, of South Africa's children get schooled at least up till the age of 15. Now, uh, those patterns are probably not going to be affected a lot, I, but we don't know because, because yes, there will be more poverty, absolutely. But in, a, in many ways, the schooling system serves as a buffer against poverty, um, for, for instance, through school nutrition. And um, so the, the situation in households will certainly worsen as, as, as incomes fall, but um, it's probably not going to impact enormously on uh, participation in the schooling system. The worst, I think, is going to be in the post-schooling system because their um, yeah, places are limited and uh, it's publicly funded largely. But uh, those public funds are are now are now limited. Um, I mean, in, with respect to to gender um, differences, um, South Africa, like like many countries, uh, has 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 a, a problem of the underperformance of boys. I mean, if you look at the um, results from the international testing systems in virtually all countries and at all levels of the schooling system, uh, girls outperform boys. And in South Africa, that, that gap is actually the largest, or one of the largest uh, among uh, countries. Um, yeah, the, of course, in, 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 in low income countries, maybe lower middle income countries, the situation is, 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 a, bit, is a bit different. And there you will, in a lot of African countries, you will see girls underperforming as, and girls dropping out. But once you reach middle income, upper middle income country uh, levels, uh, you generally see girls outperforming boys. Now, um, the fact that that gap is very large in South Africa has is under under analyzed, under studied. Um, I don't think we really appreciate that this is that this is a serious problem. And it leads to all sorts of social uh, ills. Um, more boys are dropping out. Um, males tend to engage in, 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 in criminal activity more than females. Um, so, and and in, in violence against women. So, uh, you know, the, the, in a way, the, 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 the fact that boys are so behind at school leads yeah, to all sorts of, of social problems. And those social problems include um, gender-based violence, which is which is extremely widespread in South Africa, but also very widely talked about. And it could be, you know, the, the extent to which this is, you know, we have good, relatively good data against, you know, it's it's a very widespread phenomenon. You know, we, we're not absolutely sure, but there certainly is a lot of it, and it's it's very much on the policy agenda. And I think that's why education policy is actually so crucial and so interesting because it connects to so many other kinds of public policies. Um, on that note, I think we should spend a moment to actually think about recovery a bit and the sort of recovery in the more near term sense. And that is to do with in where does education fit in the process of eating lockdown? But from what you were talking about, about the indirect effects, how, do, how does South Africa recover from here to build a stronger education sector, given what it's facing fiscally and all of these knock-on effects? Well, we first need to get back into, 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 into schools. Um, I mean, right now I am, I'm, 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 I'm advising on, um, and I've written a couple of, of, of news articles on, uh, you know, the, the, the different strands of evidence around the transmissions of children. And um, uh, we clearly, you know, sc schooling, especially for younger children, is less risky in terms of COVID-19 than we thought one month ago. Um, and that has that has big implications for getting children back into school, um, and 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 that's what we need to do. And we need to do that from an educational perspective, but also from a nutritional perspective. Uh, I mean, in South Africa, which is 
in some ways, you know, a rich country, uh, about 10% of school students are from homes where uh, at some point in the year they suffer hunger. 25, according to you know, good data, 25% of uh, children in South Africa suffer from physical stunting. So uh, nutrition, the nutritional element of schools is, uh, is really important. Um, the, yeah, I mean, in some ways, it, it, education is, 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 is the vaccine for so many social ills. We have to, we have to continue working at, uh, education. We can't lose the, the, the upward momentum that we have seen. Um, and education, you know, education can probably continue, it is probably easier to manage than a lot of manufacturing, certainly aviation and a lot of travel and transport. That's, that's a nightmare to manage. Um, in a way, the advantage with education systems is that the very young who are not mature enough to do physical distancing are, it appears, transmitting the virus at very, very low levels. So they're not at a large risk from that perspective. Youths, students who um, are more mature are more likely to be spreading the virus. And they're, um, but they're, they, physical distancing can be used, sorry. Physical distancing can be used in order to, um, to manage to some extent, the, the situation in schools. Um, one of the things I've been emphasizing here, and it probably applies in a lot of countries, is that secondary schools tend to have more mixing because of the way schools are organized. Students move around, they mix, they have different subject con combinations and so on. And that, that will certainly during, whilst the virus is still, uh, you know, with us, we are going to have to rearrange the, those types of logistics. The same applies to universities and colleges. So they, they are the practical timetabling and logistical things that need to be uh, resolved. But again, I, I get back to my point that that when people need to understand how the virus is transmitted, we need more evidence. We need more age-specific evidence. It's not enough just to say children transmit the virus less than adults. You know, who's a child, who's an adult, at which ages do transmissions start working differently? Because that has direct implications for the way we, we organize our, 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 our system. And, and, and everyone needs to understand that. Lecturers need to understand that. Teachers need to understand that. Teachers who think that their children can give them, you know, are, are at a high risk of giving them the virus are not going to be good teachers. And that's absolutely crucial for um, staging a return to schooling to maximise, if you like, educational outcomes whilst keeping the risk low in easing lockdown. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then I just wanted to ask you a bit more, if you like, the last and an uber question about um, given the anticipated contraction, economic contraction in South Africa, uh, perhaps a limited ability to borrow. Um, how? What do you do to to keep the education system going um, over the next few years in a process of recovery? What would you recommend to policymakers? People like myself need to do their work. Um, we, I think what's in this very unusual situation, researchers, analysts, people who work with data have an enormous responsibility to look creatively at the information we have, um, to package the information in such a way that as many people as possible understand it. The problem, a lot, a lot of uh, uh, researchers, especially university-based researchers, have big problems communicating important findings to policymakers. This happens even in rich countries. So, uh, really, a lot rests on on planners. Um, you know, to, to, to give you, you know, concrete examples, um, the uh, public service pay, 
will become an enormous issue in countries such as South Africa, which are under uh, this new fiscal strain. Now, how does one, uh, you know, convince public servants that the sacrifices that they will now have to make in terms of earnings are, are, are justifiable? Now, part of, of, of justifying this is to, is to present information to people. And in particular, information on inequality. Um, you know, South Africa, we talk about inequality all the time, but we're actually not very good at using data to monitor uh, changes in inequality. Not even to describe it at one point in time, but when it comes to changes in inequality, we've not done a good job. And I think that applies to many developing countries. So if society is to keep together and feel that there's, you know, there's a sufficient level of trust, there also needs to be absolute kind of, there needs to be trust around the, 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 the analysis, the figures relating to inequalities, who is paying the cost? People are paying enormous costs uh, as a result of this crisis. Um, obviously, this cost needs to be spread. Uh, it can't worsen inequalities. People will say it is worsening inequalities. They will say that. What we need to look at is, is that true? And if it's not true, where's the, where's the evidence that we are kind of spreading the, the, the pain of this across society? And for that, one needs, to, one needs data and one needs to use it well. So in short, recovery should be evidence-based and people who can understand the evidence and communicate it um, not only to politicians, but also to the public at large, have a big role to play. Yep. Great. Yep. Well, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much indeed, Martin. Thank you, Anna. It was great. Thank you.